Yeah, so hello everyone. Thank you guys all for coming. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite my colleague, Dr. Dan Opp, uh, to give a talk on LINAC technology, mainly the principles of IMRT and VMAT. Uh, it's, it's meant to be sort of uh, basic introduction to, to these techniques uh, and, and dedicated to physicists, obviously in the developing world. So I'm definitely excited to hear Dan give his talk. All right, cool. Thanks, Joe. Uh, like you said, my name's Dan. I'm a medical physicist at Moffitt Cancer Center. Um, my topic today is LINAC technology, specifically focusing on, focusing on uh, VMAT and uh, onboard imaging, which for us makes up probably like 75% of our patient load receives kind of treatments based off these technologies. So the objectives here is uh, understanding the advantages of arc-based treatment delivery, or uh, the technical term is volume-modulated arc therapy, or VMAT, and then discussing the benefits of using onboard imaging. Uh, if you see in the background, that's a picture of uh, our second newest true beam. But if you look on the left and to the right of gantry, we've got a KV source and a KV detector, which is kind of like the uh, bread and butter of onboard imaging. Oh, let me move my video thing. Okay. And then, um, so we'll start off kind of with the basics of uh, using the LINAC for delivering external beam radi radiation therapy. Uh, there's different flavors of external beam radiotherapy. You can use, well, with the LINAC, you can use photons and electrons, and then you got to get kind of a different machine to deliver protons, but that's part of the kind of external beam radiation therapy family. Um, when you're focusing on delivering photons with the LINAC, you can deliver at the kind of onset of the field. Most techniques were two-dimensional. Um, beams were shaped exclusively with the jaws and pretty much the anatomy within that field, uh, you're delivering kind of the entire dose. So it's not kind of precise, but it's uh, it gets the job done as far as, you know, uh, kind of, hitting the tumors and kind of killing the tumors. Um, to increase the precision, you can kind of use um, the jaws and to an extent MLCs and kind of rotate the gantry around. And where those gantry beams intersect, you get a higher dose in the center and uh, avoid kind of delivering low dose around that. Um, that technique is referred to as 3D to Add a variable to that, you can start shaping your beams at each stationary gantry angle and moving your MLCs um, to kind of do a three-dimensional um, modulation of your dose distribution. That's kind of referred to as a intensity modulated radiation therapy or IMRT. And then to make an improvement on that, you can actually rotate the gantry starting from you know 181 all the way to 178 or 179, and during the whole arc rotation, deliver essentially have the beam on and deliver kind of what ends up becoming vol volume modulated. And then to kind of improve the treatment efficacy of that, you can actually start in, uh, incorporating image guidance and um, kind of being more precise on where you're positioning your patients and your targets. Here's a general overview of the LINAC, which you're probably all familiar with. Um, you got the table, the gantry head. Uh, within the head, kind of the beam shaping devices you have are the jaws. Collimator isn't really beam shaping, but it does kind of add a variable in um, kind of how you can use, set up your beam to hit the target. And then there's also the multi-leap collimator within the head which is used for IRMRT and VMAT. So a little more detail on the MLC or the multi-leaf collimator. If you look in the gantry of these, you'll see kind of like uh, these thick tungsten, they're eight to 10 centimeters deep. Um, and then these outer ones are one cm wide and the inner ones are five millimeters, or you can have um, kind of your radio surgery machines, which will have two and a half millimeter internal um, leaves and one CM external leaves. So with this MLC, you have the great benefit of kind of 
shaping your dose two dimensionally. But if you kind of deliver this at different gantry angles, you'll end up shaping the dose three dimensionally. Um, of course, introducing the MLC and IMRT. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever tried to forward plan. It's called forward planning, but once the more segments you put in there, the longer it's going to take a human to plan it. So they started introducing at the onset of the MLC these optimization algorithms, which allowed essentially the treatment plan to figure out the best segments and the best uh, amount of MUs to deliver to hit your target and spare your OARs or your critical structures. Uh, so, and then, yeah, once you synchronize the MLC with your gantry positioning, you can get into the very fancy technique of volume modulated arc therapy. So if you're doing just, this is kind of an overview of if you were doing just 2D treatment, um, you're kind of only have the benefit of shaping your field's jaw or field width. Um, there's no modulation going within the field. So kind of anything you put within this field width is gonna get kind of your full dose, um, which is, we still kind of use this technique for APPA treatments, a lot of palliative cases where you need to hit kind of a large volume with full dose or whole brains. Um, but it's still a valid technique we use often. So here's kind of the dose distribution. You start using MLCs, though. You have a lot more control of how high or how low your dose gets at specific points. Um, this is a cross kind of section I grabbed from our Delta IV um, IMRT QA device. But you can see this is kind of the cross profile from a single beam. So if you kind of add these, you can add these up three dimensionally across different beam angles and essentially you can essentially deliver like whatever you, you need to or whatever you want to uh, kind of achieve your planning goals. So IMRT in general is um, kind of a static gantry delivery with uh, MLC shaping at each discrete gantry point. Um, you'll get better dose distributions with this technique versus 2D or 3D. Um, so there's really no limit on how many segments you use. Um, we kind of like plan in our clinic, we limit it to like 30 or 35, but it's there's kind of a diminishing point of returns once you get beyond you know, a certain amount of segments. So you, there's no reason to like get, get crazy with it. Um, and then, uh, so this might be counterintuitive, but your static field IMRT is actually ends up taking longer to, to deliver than your beam at because you're stopping at each gantry angle, delivering a set amount of units, monitor units versus a uh, kind of rotating through and delivering monitor units all the way through. Um, this technique is actually for our clinic is rarely used. We either do VMAT or 3D. Um, most of that's dictated by the way the patient's anatomy presents. And then uh, part of it's also billing, but that's a whole other topic. So with the, uh, the way to improve IMRT is uh, rotating the gantry all the way through. This is, I grabbed this from an early, uh, Bavarian kind of brochure, but they called it rapid arc. The technical term is BMAT. Um, and then this is kind of a little off, but this is just because it was brand new. One revolution is all it takes. We've gotten to the point where we do at least two, and it's kind of not unusual to see three or four arcs on a plan. But um, yeah, this is kind of our bread and butter as far as the way we treat most of our patients. So VMAT, you deliver multiple segments across the entire rotation. Uh, 360 degrees around the patient. Uh, the, the exclusion of that is if you're kind of doing a lot of our lung plans or anything that's a plan with a lot of lateral positioning, uh, you'll do just a 180 degree arc or a little bit less than that. Um, so this actually is a lot easier and quicker to plan versus IMRT because you don't have to select your beam angles or you don't have to toy around with your beam angles. You essentially give your treatment plan 
the entire kind of 3D space to figure out the best plan. Um, so there are dosimetrists love and prefer VMAP. It's actually easier to do a VMAP plan than it is to do a 3D plan too. Uh, you get a better, you get a clinically acceptable plan a lot faster than kind of any other technique. Um, so there's a benefit in faster planning, but also the delivery is a lot faster. So all around, it's kind of the preferred modality. Um, any clinic that has the VMAC capabilities. Um, yeah, the more flexible optimization, yeah, allows a quicker turnaround time. All right, here's a side-by-side -side kind of apples to apples comparison of VMAT versus IMRT. Um, these were taken from a paper done on evaluating TG119, but um, you can see kind of a prostate, head, neck, C-shape, and multi-targets dose distribution versus doing it in IMRT or VMAT. The kind of noticeable thing is with IMRT, you kind of get this uh, kind of star-shaped pattern where you, you get like 50% or 40% of the dose that's going out to almost the surface of, in this case, a phantom. Whereas if you use VMAT, you can really tighten that 50% isodose line. So you can really limit the volume that um, is receiving your kind of low dose, um, low dose from your treatment. Uh, here's kind of a clinical or a clinical example of IMRT versus VMAT. Uh, this is a prostate patient. Um, you can see once again the star shape pattern going on. You got your looks like so it looks like it might be 50% isodose line going to the surface here, whereas on the VMAT it's kind of tightened up and kind of the 50% mimics the shape of your prostate almost. Uh, the other benefit you'll see obviously is uh, on the dose volume histograms. So IMRT versus VMAT, you will you're not going to get any improvement on your target coverage. Um, you can more or less hit the same metrics between both techniques where your big gains are is your kind of critical structures. And in this case, you can see the blue is IMRT, red is VMAT, but the IMRT will deliver a little more dose to your, um, your critical structures, or in this case, your rectum and your left and right femoral heads. Here's an example of a prostate plane in our clinic. Uh, let me position this. So on the CT slices, you can kind of see, I turned on, uh, what is that? It's the red's the prescription dose, the blue is kind of like your 50% isodose line. Uh, if you look on the far right, I'll press play. So you can kind of see the gantry rotating around the patient's anatomy. If you look on the bottom right, you can see how the MLCs are conforming to the target. The light blue here is uh, the PTV volume. The red is the GTV volume or CTV. And we got this orange and pink, which are the femoral heads. The yellow, which is the bladder, and the green, which is the sigmoid. But you can kind of see as it rotates through, um, these kind of complicated segments are formed between each gain triangle and the beams kind of delivered in entirety through the whole process. And uh, this is where having computers really helps out because I don't know if anyone's ever actually forward planned a VMAT. You can actually do conformal arc with forward planning, but it's really kind of limited to just shaping to the PTV. Um, but yeah, this VMAT's kind of the best way, uh, the best way to deliver a treatment for a patient. So with VMAT, there's kind of a little bit increased of physics responsibilities. Um, you need to, you definitely need to commission this technique in your treatment planning system. Um, that task group 119 is an example of kind of a standardized protocol like we use to commission against. There's also a second one that's task group 240-something two, um, or 200-something. Two, but you basically take these kind of standardized plans and structure sets, push them on your onto your phantom, um, optimize a plan that meets certain constraints, and then deliver and measure 
Um, you want to measure with the ion chamber as well as measuring planar dose either if you're going to do it with a film or any sort of kind of 3D array or I would say you could get away with the planar array too, but any sort of a uh, at the minimum you need to do a planar dose, but it'd be better if you could do a volumetric measurement. Um, another additional responsibility is all VMAP patients should receive a QA or essentially a dry run that's measured. Here's an example of I got an example of the whoops, let me go back. Example of an arc check. And then below that's the matrix, which is a iron chamber array, which is pretty cool. And then the bottom left is a delta four. Uh, and then we actually currently use, if you have the software built out, you can kind of run QAs based off of log and epic files. There, I couldn't really get a good picture describing that, but um, you can, by all means, if you're a really good programmer, there's some places that build out internal versions of it, but the one we use is suncheck. Essentially, you run a QA plan, record your logs, and get your EPID images and check that, and then reconstruct your dose based off of that and check it against your treatment plan you dose. Uh, another kind of, uh, I would say, VMAX specific test is we do a monthly rotational leaf speed test. Uh, we push the leaf speed as fast as we can and rotate it from 90 to 270 and vice versa to kind of force an MLC error. You kind of, the whole reason like you do this and like patient specific QA is because you don't want the error to happen while the patient's on the table. Doing this uh, kind of like rotational leaf speed error, uh, that gives us the advantage of seeing something, seeing a problem occur before we actually get to the actual patient QA part. Um, then there's also picket vents test, which is this top left image. For us, this is all automated um, or kind of maybe about five or six years ago, five or six years ago, we had to do this with film and load it into uh, RIT and do uh, picket fence or MLC position analysis. Now we do this with EPID and use a um, sun check and it gives us the patient, or sorry, the MLC positioning based off of our EPID imaging now. And then the other thing is if for any of your end-to-end -end testing and credentialing, uh, since for us, we do most of our cases with the VMAP, that's kind of like the preferred technique to incorporate into at least our end-to-end -end testing. Credentialing is uh, protocol specific, but most of, since we treat most of our patients with VMAT, um, we end up incorporating it. But what that entails is we end up getting these phantoms from like MD Anderson or NIH, and we got to irradiate it with our preferred treatment technique, which is VMAT, and uh, kind of just make sure we're delivering it correctly. So moving on to onboard imaging. Um, so we started with the LINAC. Uh, we got a, kind of a technology jump by incorporating the MLCs and being able to do IMRT and VMAT, the next kind of technological jump was putting these kind of KV detectors and KV source on these LINACs to uh, essentially do a CT every time we treat the patient. Um, so with doing this, well, you could do a CT or orthogonal KV imaging with it, but with those uh, imaging techniques, you can achieve submillimeter localization. Um, you reduce your setup errors, uh, which means you can make tighter target margins, and I'll explain why that's significant. Uh, well, here we go. So the reason why that's significant is the smaller margin allows for you to do higher tumor dose and better normal tissue sparing since you have uh, better precision on your alignment. Um, that, though, is in combination with doing something like VMAT where you can make really tight dose distributions and kind of guarantee uh, daily position alignment or daily patient alignment. So the first OBI imaging type, uh, I, I would say that was more widely used was using this uh, orthogonal KV imaging. Um, on the right here, I got an example. Um, the one on the left side is kind of your DRR, or digitally reconstructed radiograph that comes from your treatment plan. Uh, that was generated off your planning CT. And then the right is the 
KV image from the LINAC. Uh, you can see with the KV imaging, um, it's a little fuzzy and distorted, but you can mess with the window level. But in cases like these, KV is just kind of really good for bony anatomy visualization. So any sort of bony alignment, KV is good for. Um, so yeah, KV gives you planar films. It's excellent for bony anatomy. Oh, you can also um, use, use it for aligning fiducials too. Um, a lot of our breast patients will have kind of, after they've had their lump removed, we'll have fiducials put in. And then when we get the patient on the table, we're able to kind of see the fiducials in the treatment plan and also see them on the actual KV image. Um, we actually have techniques now where we're able to do this KV imaging while we deliver a VMAT treatment. Uh, one technique we use this on is called, a, what is it? Uh, triggered imaging, where we will deliver VMAT technique and every so like 15 or 30 degrees, we take an image and make sure, we commonly use it on spine, but make sure the spine's like located where it's supposed to be under that one millimeter tolerance uh, at each angle. Uh, yeah, so doing this, if you do the thing, if you use KV images, you got to do orthogonal, you got to do two pairs that way you know where you're lining up in 3D space. So the, uh, the kind of most impressive part of the OVI, in my, my opinion, is actually being able to generate a CT every time you put a patient on the table. Uh, so it takes several KV projections. I mean, it works kind of like a regular CT. And then out of all those KV projections, it builds out a 3D reconstructive volume off of those uh, several, several projections. Um, with CT, uh, kind of, you can see everything. You can see, you can line up to bony, you can line up to soft tissue. Uh, you can pick like, a, you can see actually PTV volumes. Uh, if they're soft tissue, you can actually see, visualize your PTV volumes. It's really great for visualizing uh, lung tumors because it's there's a big contrast when you go into a solid tumor versus lung. Um, being able to do that is, why we're able to treat like a lot of our lungs in SBRT fashion or um, high dose kind of five fraction um, fashion. Oops, let me go back. Uh, so yeah, using the cone beam CT is kind of your best comparison of what the patient was set up like at simulation because you're comparing essentially your CT and your cone beam CT instead of doing a KV image or MV films. Um, the I think cone beam CTs gives kind of the whole team the best assurance that your patient is positioned correctly. And then, so you can, well, so I put in here, the matching allows for rotational corrections, but like recent uh, upgrades in at least our true beam, but I know you could do this for like exact track, but you can actually do rotational corrections in KV imaging. So that's not a big advantage of cone beam versus KV at, the, at now anymore, but with cone beam as well as KV, you can do rotational corrections, which is very beneficial for, um, we use that a lot for like our head and neck cases because the anatomy is really complicated in there and we're using VMAT on all those cases. And essentially we need a, the quarters are kind of tight between the critical structures and your target. So being able to rotate uh, helps out a lot actually. And then, we're kind of getting into this um, next kind of technology jump here, but um, we haven't started yet, but there's other places where they're actually use the cone beam or your at treatment imaging and start changing what your plan is based off of what you see the patient set up as during treatment day. So the physics responsibilities for OBI imaging, uh, the most important one, in my opinion, is localization. Uh, you need to make sure that your KV is, or your cone beam is putting the patient where they're supposed to be. If uh, that's not correct, kind of all this other stuff doesn't matter. Um, but so what we do is for, in this case, we'll use um, this top left image is an example of our kind of 
uh, I'll just call it an imaging cube, but it's got a hidden target inside and we offset it and then take an image, which the image is on the right side and line it up with the planning CT on the left. And then we go in the room, make sure the lasers are on and then take another one to make sure that the shifts were applied correctly. And I couldn't really get a good screenshot, but when you're at the console, these images are overlaid and you kind of see that the BB essentially is overlaid directly on top of each other. Uh, another responsibility is doing a MV KV coincidence test. We there's different types you can do. We do a Winston Lutz test. Um, I'm not sure about other Linac manufacturers, but they're incorporating kind of a machine performance check where there's a isocenter KV coincidence test embedded within those. Um, but kind of the one I say most reliable and vendor neutral one to use is Winston Lutz is kind of what we do to check our MB versus KV alignment. And then the other big kind of suite of tests, uh, we're kind of spoiled. Um, we kind of have, SunCheck has some automated features where we have this kind of phantom that will take care of all our image quality checks, but uh, it take care of, it reviews scaling, um, spatial resolution, uniformity, contrast, and noise. Um, these are kind of like, uh, these are task group 142 specified tests, but they have kind of minimal bearing on the quality of your alignment. So these, if these aren't, the only, only thing that go wrong is you need to like do another uniformity or another background um, scan. So it's not usually a big problem. Localization though ends up becoming something you gotta really keep your eye on and make sure it's correct. And then also, so there's this whole different set of kind of scans you need to do for your cone beam. Um, you need to check also, I don't have a, I do the same phantom as kind of the KV where we do the localization test, uh, offset it, image, align, and then go in and visualize the lasers and then do another image to make sure the targets align with your treatment plan image. Um, then that's kind of, you can do a embedded MVKV and CBCT kind of Winston Lust test as well. Uh, there's similar image quality checks on the cone beam CT. The addition though is you need to, you should check the slice thickness in the Hounsfield units. Um, this top left slice, this uh, demonstrates our kind of uh, cat fan phantom. We have these spheres, or not spheres, but these cylinders within the phantom that have different Hounsfield unit variables or values. And then this kind of line across, um, if you measure that, you do the math, you can figure out the slice thickness that your cone beam is being performed at. And then this bottom one is you end up getting your line pairs per millimeter based off of how well you can see the different um, kind of dashes. Once they disappear, that's kind of where the your line pair per millimeter stops. And so HUs currently is not critical, but with the kind of incorporation of adaptive planning, these will become more critical actually in the near future. So when you tie it all together, uh, delivering VMAT and using onboard imaging, uh, and this is kind of something we've ourselves done a lot is we've been delivering higher doses and less fractions because we're really confident with our alignment and, and we, and it's to great benefit of the patient to being able to deliver as opposed to having them come back for 25 fractions, we have them come back for five and deliver 10 gray a day or eight gray a day. But this is only possible because A, we're delivering VMAT, so we're kind of uh, minimizing the normal dose that's getting irradiated or normal, normal tissue that's getting irradiated. The other thing is though, uh, in this situation doing like cone beam CTs. So on the left, if you see is a planning CT, on the right is the actual cone beam performed on the machine. 
Um, you can kind of scroll back and forth between this to do the blended imaging test, but you can see real easily where that lung tumor is. And it's, you know, if, if a layman could come in here and see that, that that tumor is like within the GTV, you can have really high confidence that you are delivering everything to that target, which is how we're able to do these uh, SBRT or stereoty stereotypic body radiation therapy treatments. Uh, so just a kind of overview of our clinic. We currently have three trilogies. It's kind of the um, our previous generation. We do a lot of variant Linux, um, but we have three trilogies that have the that have the VMAC capability as well as the onboard imaging with the cone beam and KB. Um, the standard kind of for us now is all our machines are slowly converting to true beam. Uh, it has similar capabilities. It has similar functionality. You can do VMAT uh, and cone beam imaging. The addition to this is we can do the KV imaging during treatment or the triggered imaging. Also, the, the quality of the um, image reconstruction is a lot better. That, that's probably just has to do with how strong. So actually, I'll say for here, uh, Onboard imaging was added after the gantry was developed. So uh, all the integration was not ideal. This machine was built with onboard imaging integrated. So the reconstruction like got has uh, been a lot more improved. Um, and then the other addition is the true beams was the start of kind of standardizing to do the rotations, you need to have a robotic couch or a six degrees of freedom couch, um, which is all our true beams have that. Uh, and then, so the next kind of development as far as with onboard imaging is doing something called adaptive planning where you can take a image on the day of treatment and then quickly change the plan to best fit the way that patient looks on that day. Uh, we currently, I've employed this with our MRI LINAC, which is this on the left, um, where I mean, this is probably, I mean, they're really expensive now, but this is probably the way to go if we can fully, fully develop this technology. Uh, Cause you can deliver your radiation and look at your, get like volumetric images with the MRI while you're treating. And you can accurately gate with this since you can, see the anatomy move while you have the beam on. This is a really cool technology and it's gonna go a long way. It's just we're kind of at the infancy of it. And then on the right is a variance closed bore um, LINAC. Uh, this one is going to, we're going to start doing adaptive planning on the cone beam CTs, but the advantage with this machine is it's closed bore. Uh, there's no issue with patient safety and you can rotate you can do like six or seven arcs a minute versus as on the True Beam and Trilogy, you can only do one arc per minute. But the real uh, advantage of using this system and see if it like really works out is being able to do the adaptive planning. Um, whenever you see, so our current actual technical, our workflow is if we see image a patient and say, actually the most common ones, if there's really good tumor response, uh, the tumor is a lot shorter, smaller. So you need to, uh, you can't treat with the same plan which you're treating to a larger volume. So we have to re-image the patient, do another plan, and then, you know, set another treatment day. Whereas with this uh, Halcyon and Meridian, as soon as you see the response, you could change the plan on that day. and Or you can change the plan daily as the tumor is responding, um, which is kind of like the next big breakthrough for onboard imaging if we can fine tune it. So in summary, uh, VMAT offers better conformality, better normal tissue sparing and faster treatment delivery. It's also quicker and easier to plan. Uh, there's just a lot more, I guess, computer work involvement or, you know, uh, I wouldn't say automation yet for that, but there's, that's, it's getting there. Uh, where those processes are seem to be automated. 
Uh, with onboard imaging, you can provide some millimeter target lo localization. So having the onboard imager allows you to get a lot more aggressive with how you treat and attack these tumors by doing less fraction, higher doses, and kind of uh, you with the more aggressive treatments, you actually do get a better response most of the time, as opposed to for those smaller tumors that you can be aggressive with. If you treated those fractionated uh, 25 fractions or whatever, the response actually is not as good because um, it's if you can ever deliver higher doses, kind of the ideal way to go. Um, and I think that is it. Any questions?